Hey, it's good to have you here. Come on in, have a seat. Welcome to the Beyond Picket Fences podcast. We are your hosts, Mandy Benicky and Naomi Marquez. Hello and welcome back. Today we sat down with a friend of mine, Justina Hinterberger. Justina is a psychotherapist and private practice owner in Cornelius, North Carolina, who specializes in women in trauma. In addition to sharing her journey into the psychotherapy field, Justina shares with us her personal battle with cervical cancer and lupus. Justina is such a beautiful, kind soul, and we are truly honored to have her with us today. Please pull up a chair and help us welcome Justina Hinterberger. Hi, Naomi. Hi, Mandy. How are you? Good. How are you doing today? I'm good. 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 Well, this is exciting. Yes, we have Justina with us today. Hello. How are you? (laughs) I'm doing good. How are you? We are good. Good, good. We're excited to have you. Justina, you you. have your own podcast, right? I do. Yeah. So you are not new to the podcast game. We're kind of new, but anyway. (laughs) So, I am, but I'm not. I've been uh, <laughs> recording. I started it about a year ago, but then stopped when the wonderful pandemic hit because I had kids around all the time and a little difficult to record with a bunch of kids around. <laughs> a little bit. I have mine in bit. the basement. I'm like, just be quiet. Be quiet for like an hour, okay? <laughs> have some candy and iPads. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Best bribery there is. <laughs> All right, Justina, where would you like to start with your story today? Um, well, I think the most relevant place, I guess, being a therapist now is the beginning of where I started knowing that I wanted to be a therapist for sure. Um, when I started undergrad back in 2004 for the first time, Um, I was a broadcasting major. I wanted to be the next Katie Couric. I thought she was just the most amazing woman and I wanted to be like her. Um, My first day of COM 100 class, there were over 100 of us in a lecture hall and the professor told us there were going to be four of us that would get a job in our field when we graduated. Oh, man. (laughs) Yeah. So I wasn't feeling too confident and I was taking a intro level psych course that semester just because it was a prerequisite, a thing you had to take. And I fell in love. Um, The professor was amazing. All of the material was amazing. And I just started trying to gobble up all that I could. I was in undergrad for a year. And when I was 19, I went for a routine checkup at the gynecologist Mm -hmm. and found out that I had cervical cancer. So then that quickly spiraled into anxiety, depression, and being overwhelmed, obviously, at 19 and trying to manage college and a cancer diagnosis that seemed very scary, which ended up being very minimal. Thank goodness I had surgery and we've never heard of it again, which is amazing. It was amazing. But How scary at 19 yeah, yeah. before you had kids. Right. And the first OB that I saw that he found the abnormalities before I went and got it tested to find out that it was cancerous told me that it was from HPV and it was from being promiscuous. At this point, I had one boyfriend. I had been with one guy ever and it just wasn't the case. What a jerk. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, my first experience with like the medical system being like, what? And it turned out I didn't have HPV either. That wasn't where the cancer came from. It was just a random occurrence. So it's Mm -hmm. like, so you were wrong on all fronts. Thanks, guy. (laughs) (laughs) So I had met my now ex-husband after I took a job to get health insurance and start paying back those school loans. Um, Then soon thereafter, I moved to North Carolina with him. He got a job down here and I followed Not long after we got married, had kids, got married super fast. We had only known each other for like six months, which is crazy. Did you meet him in college or where did you meet him? No, I met him at work. So when I got the job to get the health insurance and to start paying back those bills, he worked at the mobility company that I got the job at and that's where we met. So did you have health insurance when you went through your surgery for cervical cancer or? 
I did through school, but it was only like a certain period after I had stopped going and it went away. So if I would have not gotten a job to get that health insurance, I wouldn't have been able to go back for any of my checkups and all oh, the fun stuff. It. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Healthcare system in America is wonderful. Oh, you're telling me. <laughs> <laughs> Such a nightmare. <laughs> okay, sorry. So, <laughs> no worries. Uh, yeah, so I ended up down here in North Carolina where I am now with him. And we had a little boy, and I decided to be a stay at home mom with lots and lots of pressure from him. It's not something I ever wanted to be, but he made me feel like I should be the person with him and raising him. And begrudgingly, I agreed. I started making cakes for fun, and I was pretty good at it. And I did that for a couple of years and decided to move back home to open a bakery. It made most sense to me to move home because that's where I knew the most people, would have the most support. And so I moved back, and a few months later, he was able to transfer with work, and he moved back with me. Where is home? Buffalo, New York. Oh, okay. Yeah. And he, by the time he had come several months later, we had very much grown apart, and all of the issues we'd been having in our marriage became very apparent, and we separated. Um, very long story short with the bakery, we had a terrible, terrible landlord, And I ended up having to get out of the lease because all of the equipment that I was renting from him started breaking and it was a disaster. My ex-husband and I made a decision to not continue on with trying to find another location. And he and I were having some stress relief and I now have a daughter. (laughs) Uh, so he and I were actually separated when my daughter was conceived, but that's a whole another fun story. Um, so she was born. We tried to make it work, and he convinced me to move back to North Carolina. I no longer had a bakery. We had had a hard time trying to sell our house down here. It was in 2013, and the housing market was terrible. So I moved back. Um, shortly after I moved back, My best friend, Vanessa, who was back home in Buffalo, she had been struggling with lymphoma for several years, but shortly after I moved back, they put her into a medically induced coma because she got very, very sick very quickly. And about a month after that, she passed. That Mm. sent my whole world into a tailspin. She had been my person since I was 13. Like if there was, I was the person who wrote her eulogy and delivered her eulogy, if that gives you an idea of how close Mm. we were. Um, She was my person that if there was something good, something bad, immediately she was the person that I would call, that I would text for anything and everything. And she never judged me. She was the one person in the world that I allowed to see who I was with my husband, ex-husband now, I always felt like I had to be someone else who the person he wanted, the person his family wanted. With her, it was always, she just let me be me and she didn't judge me. She loved me for who I was. And without her, I felt like I had nothing. Um, Found myself back in therapy and he pushed me to go back to school and to make connections with other moms, which I did. And so I started back in undergrad for psychology and I met a whole other bunch of other moms locally and randomly started on a discussion about postpartum depression. And one of the moms had just had a baby and went for her checkup after she had the baby and asked, hey, is it normal for the doctor to give me this screener with all these questions about how I'm feeling? And everybody assured her that it was normal and it wasn't some conspiracy. Like this poor woman thought that the doctor had it out for her and was suspicious. Um, But it's a pretty normal thing. And everybody around the table all agreed that they had all lied on this screener, which blew my mind. Like none of these women were being truthful about their feelings after having a baby 
for a whole range of reasons, like they believed that someone would take their baby or that something was wrong with them, all because nobody had ever talked to them throughout their pregnancy about postpartum depression or anxiety or how they might be feeling after. It was insane. So what? Yeah, that is insane. So what, like, what were they talking about? I, I luckily have never dealt with postpartum depression myself. I know a little bit about it from friends that have had it, but like you said, um, there's some people who have into a lot of, yeah, enormous feelings of anxiety and fear about their children. Like they can't sleep or they have intrusive thoughts or nightmares about something breaking into their house and taking their baby or just something bad happening constantly. So much so that it takes over their life or going into fits of crying or anger. Anger Mm -hmm. is a really common one that we don't typically look to or think of when depression, we think depression, we think really sad all the time. Another symptom can be anger, which was something that was surprising to most of them. And it was something that was surprising to me when I started researching it too, that it's not just always sadness. It can come out as anger and being reactive and which some of that can be normal, not sleeping as a new mom, but Mm -hmm. to excess, it's, it's not good, but they didn't feel like they could reach out to anyone because there was so much shame around admitting that you might need help or there might be something wrong that you weren't a perfect mom and you didn't just know what to do as soon as the baby came. Mm -hmm. So I started doing research around postpartum depression when I went back to school and finished my undergrad in health psychology and whole time I was back in school for two and a half years finishing my undergrad, I was making cakes again for people locally. I had kind of aligned myself with this local mom group and they all, once I started making cakes for like a dozen people, they I was the person they referred to everyone. I didn't ever market. So I <laughs> it went from just making cakes for these few people to I was booked out a year in advance and it got crazy. Um, mm-hmm. So by the end of undergrad, I said, well, maybe I can do this cake thing here. Maybe I'll give myself a little bit of time and see if I can do this. So I decided to give myself a year after I finished undergrad and pursue the cake thing. And that at the end of the year, if it didn't go well, that I would go back to grad school for counseling and go that route. Well, a couple of months into that journey of making cakes full time, I ended up in a ton of pain in my joints. I was having fevers. I just felt awful. I was spending three to four days baking cakes all day and night and then spending the rest of the three or four days of the week in between resting and getting myself back to a baseline and kind of normal. Mm -hmm. And it was a cycle. I couldn't figure out what was wrong. Went to multiple different doctors before I finally found out that it was lupus. Mm -hmm. And that significantly altered my path again. I thought I was going to do this thing that when I closed the bakery in Buffalo, I believed that I could do it again someday. It just wasn't the right circumstance. So when I found out that I had lupus and it was going to significantly impact my life in the way that I could live my life, and it it just it crushed me. I, again, was very depressed and my ex-husband was not very supportive of the idea of me wanting to make cakes to begin with. Um, He didn't see it as a viable career option. And we again decided to separate and we divorced then. Mm -hmm. But uh, along that time, I consulted with a whole bunch of different rheumatologists and other doctors. And they all told me basically the same thing that I was going to need to make some changes to the way I was doing things physically, or I was not going to end up in a good state that I could end up dying early if I did not take care of myself. Mm -hmm. Um, Justina, I have a question for you. Um, Yeah. Was there a, when was this? Wait, wait, how long ago? It was two and a half years ago, almost three years. So, at this point, 
there, did you feel that there was a lot of information about lupus when you were diagnosed? I didn't. I, I scoured the internet, but pretty much the doctors just told me that it could be really bad. It could not be really bad. And we didn't know. And I could take medication to help the symptoms, but that was pretty much it. I was stuck with it for the rest of my life and that I would need to make changes or it would send me to an early grave. Hi there. We wanted to take a moment of your time to invite you to join our Facebook community by searching Beyond Picket Fences and clicking like on our page. Instagram at BP Fences, Twitter at BP Fences, or as always on our website at bpfences.com. Sign up on our website to receive occasional emails and updates. We also invite you to support Beyond Picket Fences and our mission by subscribing to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash beyondpicketfences slash join. Thanks for your support. Now back to the episode. Did you find that there were support groups for you, for people going through lupus who needed the to educate each other versus reaching out to the medical industry to help you? I didn't. It was only recently that I found some local support. And even then, I feel like I'm one of the people who is younger, but there's some celebrities like Selena Gomez, who she mm -hmm. is very public about her. She has lupus as well, and she's very public about it. And that has helped, I think, a little bit. Um, people kind of recognize what it is and how bad it can be. Hers is really awful. She had to have a kidney transplant and thankfully mine has not been that bad for sure. But yeah, it's only been recently that I found more people to connect with to feel like I'm not alone. I'm sorry for that. You, you know, I think about illnesses where there's been a lot of research. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, information like what you said, like you can search the internet and you can find um, books and right. blogs and Facebooks and um, all these different um, mediums that you can find information. And when you don't have that, mm -hmm. it's hard to understand how you reconcile with your diagnosis when Absolutely. there's not a lot of information out there. Yeah, And that has got to be so hard. I feel like with a lot of auto, I also have an autoimmune disease and with, mm -hmm. with a lot of them, there's so little information out there. Even yeah. the, the specialists that you go to, they don't know what they're dealing with. Nope. Um, and so they don't know how to help you. That's been my experience as well. Same. They just, yep. they know a few, so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> they, know, they know a few medications that might work for you. So yeah, they basically, they're try this. and that's all right. they have to offer. Yep. Um, and then they start layering medications, which mm -hmm. I mean, we all know what, what happens to your body when you start to do that. But um, anyways, so yeah, it's, 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 it's a huge issue. It and is. I, I know through conversations with um, people that autoimmune diseases a lot of times to people because there's not a lot of research and there's not a lot of information they don't think it's real yeah and i mean that's yeah. got to be mm -hmm. difficult you know in trying to put myself in your shoes how do you talk about it if people don't understand it they don't think it's right. real mm -hmm. and you you know it is it and is. you know how painful it is and you're scared of what the outcome could be but who do you talk to yeah until my uh, it was actually my internist who first suggested it. It was like I was having a bunch of symptoms kind of all over the place. Like I started having joint pain. And then another time I had joint pain and a fever. And then another time I just have a fever. And everything was kind of all over the place and like swelling. And until it was this perfect culmination of all the things that I started having rashes as well as the swelling in my joints that they actually were giant discus rashes from my hips and in from my shoulders and from my knees down my calves that he said, I think that might be a lupus. And then I start researching it and I see all these symptoms and I'm like, I've been having these symptoms on and off since I was a teenager, but wow. it was blown off because, oh, it's growing pains 
or I was tested for rheumatoid arthritis when I was a teenager, but because, because I was having pain and swelling in my joints then. And she sent me home with wasn't Motrin, something along the lines of ibuprofen to try and help the swelling, but it ended up making me sick. So I just dealt with it and just thought it was normal. And then finding out that lupus could have been, I went through, I was pregnant nine times and had two live babies and then found out that that's a thing with lupus, that holding on to pregnancies and not holding on to pregnancies and seemingly being no other reason, it was that. And I had internalized losing pregnancies early on as being my fault, something I was doing wrong. And it wasn't me at all. <laughs> I'm so sorry for that. How, how painful looking back and realizing and tying all of these loose ends together mm-hmm. and realizing your health issues that you've been trying to deal with and not understanding it mm-hmm. now tying in losing pregnancies, right? That, that Mm -hmm. for you, was that healing to finally tie them all together and know the cause? Or did that frustrate you because you should have known earlier? Both. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It it kind of felt freeing that I could say that I, there was nothing that I could have done. I kept telling myself that I was doing something wrong. If I could just do X, Y, Z, then I could fix it. And I was finally able to come to terms with it was my body and not anything that I could help. So that there was that. But then the other portion of saying, I've been complaining since I was 14 years old to doctors about this pain and these things that I'm going through and nobody wants to listen. And Mm -hmm. nobody delved in to autoimmune disease when I was losing pregnancies. It was not something that was tied in. There's said that we can't find any cause other than it's just your body. You're just, your body just doesn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That was it. (laughs) It's interesting. You said at one point they were giving you something like ibuprofen to deal with, you know, some rashes Mm -hmm. or swelling because um, with autoimmune disease, you're not supposed to have any insets. Mm -hmm. They're pretty, pretty harsh on your body. Really? Like, yeah, you're not supposed to take ibuprofen, Tylenol, none of those, Mm -hmm. which is why you end up on you know, steroids all the time to help yep. any of that. But um, wow. so if if you're given that before you're diagnosed, like what was that doing to your body, you right. know? Right. And yeah. So as a teenager, they said, well, the rheumatoid arthritis marker was negative. So you don't have RA. Here's this to help with the swelling. It could just be from you being a teenager and growing. And I was a dancer. So it could have just been pain from that. That's what they chalked it up to. Treat the symptoms and send me on my way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like that's the same with so many things. And with mental illness, it's the same. They will see the physical symptoms of what you're going through and completely dispel everything else that's behind it and just treat the symptom and send you on your way. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. We were just talking about that yesterday. Mm Mm-hmm. So true. Here's this pill. It'll make you feel better. Don't mm-hmm. worry about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So how did how did having lupus take you through – how did that tie into your professional journey? Yeah. So I decided on my own terms finally that I needed to be done with baking, that I was completely exhausting myself, that I was not going to have a good quality of life if I continued on that path. And – went and took the GRE with (laughs) literally days to spare before the application deadline that I would have gotten my scores back and applied to grad school for counseling and went through the whole process, was accepted and started school. (laughs) Thank you. Um, And the whole time that I was going through the interview process, I was kind of meh about it. And then my first semester when we started actually practicing counseling skills with other people. And one of my professors sat and watched me and she said, you're, you're natural at this. You're so good at it. And I, that was the first time in a long time that I think I'd had anybody tell me that I was really good at something, which is sad and in itself, but I kind of went home and thought, wow, 
maybe this is it. Maybe this is my thing. And so I delved more into it. And as soon as I started seeing clients, it, it just clicked. The feeling of being able to help somebody through something and having someone tell you that you've gotten them through something, you've made them conceptualize something different, that I helped move them through something they never thought that they would get through. It's it is truly the most fulfilling thing that I've ever, ever felt. That it has to be an amazing feeling because even somebody who's on the outside, you know, even, you know, just the thought of going to a therapist, one of the thoughts I think I have and a lot of people is like, oh, what are they going to do? Like, right. I live my life. I know me the best. How mm-hmm. can they possibly help me mm-hmm. through this? Yeah. And when you're in a state of depression or going through trauma, um, feeling like no one can help you is really, it's, you know, it's awful. It's discouraging it is awful. Um, because you're like, you know, okay, this is going to be my life forever. So mm-hmm. for you being the person that gets them past that, that has to be an amazing feeling. It, it definitely is. It was um, an internship. My first client that I had, he had childhood trauma that he did not conceptualize as trauma. He treated it as a normal relationship thing, and it wasn't. Um, I don't want to delve too much into that, but I helped him conceptualize this as this is this is trauma. This was a terrible thing that happened to you. Do you not? And he pieced together how those early life experiences led to the maladaptive behaviors that he was living out now. And he said it completely changed the way he saw the entire world and that I was the first person that helped him connect the dots, that he had been to multiple therapists and they just listened to him and kind of give him some exercises and coping strategies, but didn't help him actually go back and conceptualize how to break the pattern. That's amazing. I mean, you probably saved his life, right? (laughs) (laughs) I, I could have. And that knowing that I could have just a small piece and change, even just changing the path. He was not on a good path. He was doing some pretty destruct, self-destructive things that could have absolutely led to his death, but it changed the pattern. And that's all I needed was a disruption in that pattern. And as far as I know, the last I checked in with him was about two months ago and he was still doing really well. And it feels amazing. Awesome. That's really exciting. You know, I, um, I think about my experience with, um, I call it mental therapy because there's all sorts of kind of therapy that I do. But, Mm -hmm. um, after, after I was diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer, um, my doctor forced me to see a therapist Mm -hmm. and I lied and said, no, 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 I'm great. I just like Mandy said, I can handle it myself. I've had, you know, all this stuff my whole life. Nobody Mm -hmm. can help me better than I can help me. And I will tell you, Justina, I still, to this day, see a therapist. I see a therapist proactively. Mm -hmm. And to your exact point, I did not know the trauma in my life was actually trauma. Mm -hmm. I dismissed it as life experiences Mm -hmm. and just moved on. Right. And for anybody listening who is on the fence about therapy, what I will tell you is talking about it, and really understanding how you live today is related to the trauma that happened to you in your life and how you react to people and how you um, uh, uh, live the experiences through the day that you don't even realize mm-hmm. you're doing that. Therapy helps you recognize that stuff and it helps you embrace that and really own those pieces of it. So Justina, when you're, when, if you could talk to the listeners about therapy and how, Mm -hmm. how do they, how do they even start finding a therapist and finding the, the route that they should do? Yeah. So each of us really specialize in different things. Um, so it'll be what you resonate with and truly kind of shopping around. And if the first therapist or the second therapist does not feel like a good fit and they f- you feel like they don't hear you or don't understand you, 
None of us are offended. I promise if you say, I don't think this is a good fit, we will help you find somebody else. But um, there is a website called Psychology Today where pretty much every therapist in our country is on there. And Mm -hmm. we put different specific things that we're really good at and that we're really passionate about. So read through some of those profiles and see if there are things that resonate with you. And if there are, all of us also who are credible will do a free 30 minute consultation, usually by the phone. And you can ask any questions that you want to ask. And if it just doesn't feel right, don't schedule an appointment. Or if you want to give it a chance and see them for a month, go and see them for a month. And if it doesn't work again, I promise none of us are ever offended. If you say, I don't feel like this is a good fit. I don't feel like this is working. We will absolutely help you try and find somebody else who can. And by that point, after two or three sessions, we get a good idea of if we can't be the best fit for you, we definitely know somebody who can. So all of us work very well collaboratively. We know it's not a battle over clients truly genuinely, we want to help people. So we will work with you to help people. And I believe everybody needs therapy, whether you have past trauma, whether you have anything, we all have relationship issues. It feels good to just have that unbiased third party that you can say anything to. And we hear you, we will listen to you without judgment, without any prior notions about who you are, who you should be. It's about you. And that feels really good and really freeing to be able to be you in that space. Great advice. Great advice. So, um, so you, when you were working with that young man that was still in school? Yes. Yep. Okay. So you're still in school then. Yeah. Um, and it was my you're... first uh, of three semesters as an intern. So that was just completely life-changing for me and realizing that I was on the right path. And this was what I – it just clicked. <laughs> I thought, this is, this is what I was meant to do. This is it. And you have your own practice now? I do. I just what? opened. Yeah, <laughs> September 1st. <laughs> Yay. That's Congratulations. Amazing. Congratulations. It's terrifying and exciting at the same time, but I felt like it was the best way. So I spent those three semesters working for someone else in a um, place called Hopeway Foundation, and they're a nonprofit, and they do incredible, incredible things. And they do a lot of group therapy, and they so there is where I fell in love with integrative therapies that they do art therapy, they do yoga, they do all different modalities and bring it all together and individualize it for what people need. And I love that so much. So I took that concept and kind of carried it with me. But there they kind of broadly treat mental illness where I went through a lot of specialized training while I was in school so that I could best help women and best help women who have been through trauma and who have experienced any type of basically anything that could go wrong during the perinatal period, which is any time trying to conceive through a year after pregnancy, anything in that time that I can help with. And I've gone above and beyond to take any training that I can on that so that I can best help that population and working in a an organization that sees mental illness on a broad scale does really amazing things. And I'm really glad that I had that experience, but I want to be able to help a very specific population. So I felt like private practice was the best way to do that. That's really amazing. I, um, I had three miscarriages. I was young. I was in my early twenties and they, you know, to your point, the doctors don't help you through that process. No. And it's hard. They don't. Um, and, you know, you as a woman, you remember where you had, at least my experience and mm-hmm. a couple of my girlfriends, you remember where you lost that baby, right? Because it's a it's a big, you know, there's a lot of mess that's you involved your, in yeah. that. You're losing a child. Well, and it's a mess, <laughs> yeah. right? Because oh. you're not supposed to be bleeding and mm-hmm. clotting like those. It, mm-hmm. it, so, you know, something's happening. Yeah. And it's when you scary go to the doctor, yeah, they don't work through how are you feeling? You know, this is what's happening with your body. This is, you know, how things are going. And I remember. Never mind, do they tell you you're going to, your hormones are going to suddenly crash? 
Yeah, no, they don't talk about anything. And I remember they told me it was how I was having sex with my husband. What? I blamed and you again. I was wow. like, it was the most bizarre. And I was young, a young girl. Like I, I didn't yeah. have the confidence to push back on a doctor. And then to your point, Justina, about um, the year after a baby, we talked about this in another podcast. Um, I had a cesarean, so I didn't see my daughter for um, four hours after she was born. Mm-hmm. And doctors don't help you through that process of that detachment that you have when you don't see your baby for the first time mm-hmm. and you, you wake up and you're not pregnant anymore. And I so f- freeing now to have mental therapy, to be able to work through those things that you don't think are a big deal. Mm-hmm. And for you to actually have a practice that is going to help women in an area that I know that women are still not treated no. for losing babies when through miscarriage and that year after your baby mm-hmm. is born. And how, how I, I'm going to ask like, how do you get your message out to women? Like, what are you going to go through? Like hospitals? Or are you going to go through support groups? Cause this is really so amazing. That was kind of my plan. Um, yeah. When I was in school and I decided to, um, start a private practice. That was my plan was to kind of go in and meet with birth practitioners and hospitals, but COVID has thrown mm-hmm. a wrench into that because mm-hmm. I can't really just walk into practices now and say, Hey, I'm so-and-so. Yeah. Um, so it's been a little difficult trying to get people to talk to me. Um, my internist and their office, I went there for a checkup and they all have my business cards now and note they've been on track with me the whole time I was in school and kind of knew what I was doing. So when I went in for my checkup, they said, so did you graduate yet? Are you ready to see clients? I said, no, not yet, but on September 1st, I am. So they were ready to (laughs) refer, (laughs) which is great. But, uh, and same thing with my uh, GYN that I see, he knew that it was coming and he's said that he would refer people, but I don't know that that will necessarily happen. We'll see. Um, but I want to be able to go into offices and have that discussion with them and yeah. speak to their nurses, the ones who have – they're kind of on the front lines talking to women when they're pregnant and when they're trying to conceive to let them know, hey, it is pretty common. Or even having that conversation with women if and when they do have a miscarriage. Hey, mm-hmm. it, it actually is very common. About 30% of pregnancies are lost. It's – yeah, I think Very about where I was at Planned Parenthood for one of them. And, um, you know, I'm just thinking about what great work you're going to be doing, mm-hmm. right? And how do you mm-hmm. get that message out mm-hmm. to women if the facilities aren't, well, I'm mm-hmm. here for brainstorming. Maybe Planned Parenthood yeah. is a good place to start. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. really good work. I'm super excited. Yeah. I've just gonna... been kind of marketing with local therapists mm-hmm. that know what I do now. And trying to get into some local mom groups and kind of market that way. And hopefully the world will begin to return to normal eventually. And I can go and have those conversations in person because it's been very difficult to get them to answer emails and phone calls when they think I'm trying to sell something. And I don't want to sell something. I just want to help people. (laughs) For our listeners, then we're going to put Justina's um, information in the show notes. And if anybody has any contacts or if they have any um, uh, marketing suggestions and or Justina, would you like people to reach out to you if they've got some contacts that might be helpful for you? Sure, I would love that. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, I can only treat people in North Carolina because that's where I'm licensed. But yeah, I would take Oh, okay. I understand. So it's not something you can do over the phone or no. anything. I wish they'd change that because yeah, pe- people are people. <laughs> yeah. I didn't there realize needs to be, you could Yeah. Do there needs that. to be reciprocity across state lines for sure. Yeah. And especially now, like wow. I, I know a lot of people, um, all of my friends, I think, who see therapists on a regular basis are seeing them either Zoom or over the phone. And yeah, almost everything is telehealth. Right it's now. amazing. They love mm-hmm. not having to go to the office all the time because right. they're in a safe space. Mm-hmm. Um, it's more convenient yep. that to just you know call instead of having to drive there and find somebody to watch the kids and all that exactly. stuff. Exactly. Yep. And that's a huge barrier for me for seeing women, especially new moms, that it's hard to fit it in. Mm-hmm. Especially, yeah, when I can't imagine baby, like trying yeah, to escape for to 
let's therapy. say moderately two hours, an hour for a session, maybe 30 minutes to get to me and 30 minutes home. That two hours away from a newborn is a long time. Mm-hmm. Well, and then you have to, you know, you have to process that after mm-hmm. your session right. with your kid around. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep, for sure. Yep. So hopefully uh, the powers that be will get with it. It's been something that all of us have been actively trying to do for a while. So hopefully this pandemic will actually make positive steps forward now that there were some kind of gray areas with ethics and telehealth and HIPAA compliance. But I think the pandemic has kind of pushed through that and kind of put some new regulations in place so that it still stays ethical. Mm -hmm. Um, But hopefully in other areas of medicine, it seems to be easier like the, the HIPAA you know that is is mm-hmm. a little bit more lax which mm-hmm. you know is obviously more helpful now for sure for sure yeah hopefully I would love to be able to help anybody who needs it but for now I'm restricted to North Carolina <laughs> well North Carolina it is <laughs> <laughs> well, this is really great Justina thank you. really appreciate you taking the time well thank you guys for listening yeah it was awesome all right everybody thanks for joining you. us Thanks, Justina. Thanks, Justina.